Hello, good morning. I'm Crystal Tomei, and today I have the pleasure of chatting with Dr. David Adelson for the next in the AANS Leaders of Neurosurgery interview series. Dr. Adelson received a bachelor's degree from Columbia College and attended medical school at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He completed his internship and residency at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a pediatric neurosurgery fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital. He began his career at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where he ascended to hold the A. Leland Albright Endowed Chair of Neurological Surgery and served as the Vice Chairman of Research at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Following that, he went on to establish the Barrow Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital, where he held the Diane and Bruce Halley Endowed Chair for Children's Neuroscience. Now he has transitioned to his next chapter at West Virginia University, where he is the vice chair of the West Virginia University Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute and executive director of WVU's Medicine Children's Neuroscience Center. He is a renowned expert in pediatric neurosurgery with a particular interest and expertise in epilepsy surgery, and also an editor of one of the staples of pediatric neurosurgery, Principles and Practice of Pediatric Neurosurgery. So good morning. (laughs) It's truly a joy to actually be able to uh, have this chat with you, uh, not only as a leader in, in neurosurgery, but as one of my mentors. Um, so I'm really excited for others to be able to learn from your experience. Thank you, Crystal. It's uh, great to be here and uh, very much appreciate this honor. I, as we talked about, I wasn't sure I was ready for this, but uh, we'll, we'll give it a go. Fantastic. So, so now that you've kind of moved on to this next chapter in your life, and as you're as you're continuing on in your career, what do you think, uh, and what would you like your legacy to be? No, I, it's really quite funny. I I really enjoyed the um, the whole path process. Um, you know, I've made a joke that uh, that this is, you know, David Adelson 3.0 um, for this next chapter in my professional life. Um, you know, it's it's really fascinating. I don't really look at the. I mean, I made a joke about chapters because I I spent 14 years in Pittsburgh, followed by you know 14 years in in Phoenix. So I'm on this sort of 14 year cycle, um, but you know. Um, when I look back, I, I think that I always really enjoyed and really found my niche in, in being able to build programs and centers and institutes. And um, that's a real the part of uh, my experience that I really enjoy. And when I think about, you know, the things that um, I've had the opportunities to do, you know, this is is really where I feel like I've been building my career. And um, I guess ultimately what, you know, my legacy will be. Uh, the reality is that trying to build a program or a center or an institute or, or any of those things, what you find is it's really bringing together a team of people. And I always just really enjoyed being part of a team and really with a common purpose. And so you bring together people, you identify what are the needs and the gaps and, and develop the resources and then space. And, you know, then it's um, to laugh, it's, it's rinse and repeat. So, uh, you know, I mean, while I'm in a, a, a different location, what really became um, exciting for me over the years, you know, first in building programs, um, building on clinical care, building on the comprehensive aspects of care, bringing together all the different um, components of that. And really epilepsy and epilepsy surgery was, was really a great template for that because of all the need of different and multidisciplinary approaches to uh, the care of these children and and adults that, you know, that I would treat, you really needed everybody. And, you know, the neurosurgeons, you know, the ultimate downstream effect when you sort of think about it 
you know, they have to have gone through, you know, medical therapy and imaging and all of these different things. And so having that as a, a really great structure or great example really allows us to think about how do we then build centers and institutes and things, because we really want to bring together all the disparate areas of the subspecialty and all the disciplines in order to really improve the care that we give. And so I think when you kind of talk about legacy is, I guess, I feel like my, I hope my legacy will be that I really made a difference in the lives of children and and adults, um, not in just in the patients and their families, but you know, in my um, colleagues, in my colleagues in all the different disciplines, um, um, my colleagues in my department and and um, in the university. Um, I'm fortunate now to now be able to actually take this formula and try to build across a health system, which is for me was amazing. Um, and, and really what made me decide to make another change um, was because I thought, wow, you know, wouldn't it be great to have an impact across the, the state with a, a system that really um, engendered that theme and that purpose. And um, uh, I think that's uh, kind of coming full circle in what I started, which was, you know, learning to build teams and programs and then elevating that into centers and institutes and health systems. Um, uh, I, I think that's what I would see my legacy is that I truly made a difference in, in, in the care of, of patients and their families and, and hopefully the people around me. So that's, I, I think that's one of the things that sticks out to me mostly in your career is that it's been more than just neurosurgery. It's, it's been a lot of the neuroscience Institute. So you, you mentioned kind of neurosurgery is the very downstream effect of, of epilepsy. So how did, how did you take our little microcosm of neurosurgery and elevate it to that level? Like what, what was sort of behind that decision and how do you find as the neurosurgeon leading these types of neuroscience institutes, um, sort of how did that arise for you? Yeah, you know, I think I was very fortunate in, you know, in becoming interested in, in pediatric neurosurgery because, you know, we so much depend on, you know, other specialists and other people who, you know, are part of the, the care continuum. And when you think about epilepsy surgery, if, if you don't have the epileptologist and you don't have the imaging, you're not doing many cases. And, and I, I've been in those situations. Uh, you know, when I first moved to Arizona, um, I had a couple of epileptologists, but they didn't really have a absolute, like, let's get these kids cured attitude per se. And, um, you know, that over time it, it built up and, and, and again, you're, you're, you, you want to have great outcomes. And, and so, you know, patient selection is important and, you know, making sure you're doing the right things and having good outcomes. And so, but as part of um, building that program, it's building that trust across, you know, your team. Um, you know, I really loved when I, when I was in training, um, Donald Becker was, was the chair at UCLA uh, when I was there. And, one of the things that he always liked to say about a neurosurgeon was that if you were on an island in, you know, and you can only pick one doctor type of doctor to have on that island with you, he wanted people to think they needed a neurosurgeon. Now, you know, why was that? Well, they could do everything. Well, I, I realize it's not so much you can do everything as much as maybe you can help lead and you can engage others and, you know, you're a leader in the operating room and it, um, you know, as I've learned over the years, you know, having that, that, that beautiful symphony of, um, 
and dance of the the OR and and every movements and and I, I mean I know you know this but you know when you're in that operating room and everything is flowing and you're in that zone and it's just it's just so exquisite when everybody knows what they're doing and and how you're doing that how and what needs to be done and what comes next and you know when you have a fantastic scrub tech and you know who you know is handing you what you need not what you ask for you know and uh, you know those are those are really great moments and but to get to that point really does require a lot a lot of work and i think that neurosurgery because we shoot for this concept of excellence and perfection and um, you know, we, we really do look for those little moments where, you know, truly everything comes together, but to get there is a lot of work. And, and I think that neurosurgery is a discipline, you know, we're not afraid of work and we're not afraid of, of putting in the time that's necessary. And, um, I think that's really how you can take leadership for a neurosurgery program and then make that into a um, into a center or into an institute or into a health system. You know, really that underlying quality of, you know, meticulous to detail, to excellence, to, you know, how do we provide this multidisciplinary approach? Um, you know, I think that when we look at all the different disciplines of uh, neurosurgery and pediatric or functional or spine or cerebral vascular, you know, it's no longer the, the lone neurosurgeon. And it really does require so many other people uh, to um, get you the um, information, the diagnosis, you know, the diagnostic um, imaging or studies or whatever they may be to then, you know, the decision-making for surgery. And then in particular, the outcomes and, and really working on, you know, the uh, improving those outcomes, whether through physiatry or behavioral medicine or, or uh, whatever it may be. So taking, taking kind of a step back to even how, how you entered into neurosurgery. So how, how did you find your way into this field and, and who were those individuals along the way that really helped shape your career? Well, um, I, I really wasn't considering neurosurgery when I went to medical school. I, I think I kind of felt like I wanted to do surgery just because I really loved anatomy and physiology and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, Kind of a funny story when I was in medical school, and uh, you've probably heard this because it's one of my Adelson stories. But um, um, you know, we we were assigned a mentor in medical school, and and um, it, in my case, it happened to be a neurosurgeon. And um, I went for the first meeting. It was like in February or March of um, of my first year of medical school, and. Um, I sat down and we introduced each other and and uh, this individual just went on and on and on about how great neurosurgery was and because he had asked me you know are, are you thinking about neurosurgery and I said you know I really hadn't given it a thought yet and he says oh it's the greatest field and he just goes on and on and on about how how great a field neurosurgery is and I, you know I'm getting kind of excited here and uh and then he says, well, how did you do, you know, in your first semester in, in medical school? And I said, well, I passed everything. And he says, um, well, um, did you get any honors? Because it was honors pass fail. I go, um, no, no, not yet. And he goes, oh, maybe neurosurgery is not for you. And, and so I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe neurosurgery is not for me. And, um, but I was very fortunate at, at Columbia. And uh, there's a lot of great neurosurgeons from Columbia, and that's because it had such a great um, medical school uh, curriculum for neuroscience and, and neurosurgery. And so actually in my second year of, of medical school, I you know took the neuroscience course and it was led by Eric Kandel, and who obviously everybody knows is a Nobel Prize, but a winner as well as 
Richard Abel, who was also on the curriculum. And, and so, you know, these were just real luminaries in neuroscience. And I, I started to get, you know, very interested in that. And then when I came up and I still didn't think I could get in. So, I mean, I wasn't even considering it until I, you know, I did a third year rotation and, um, and I was getting honors in my clinical, uh, mostly in my clinical um, uh, years. But the, uh, the funny thing was, is I, I met um, Peter Carmel, who really was a huge influence on both of us. And that's what one of our shared legacies is, is Peter is, you know, a larger than life individual. And um, I just, you know, I, I, he took to me and I, as, and similarly to me to him. And I just, I just enjoyed working with him all the time. And, and you know, I spent my times, you know, even not in the OR or not on other rotations would be, you know, following him around. And, um, uh, he had a, a wonderful influence on me and, and, and getting me into neurosurgery and getting me interested. I told him the story, uh, that I, I just told relative to, you know, does he really think I can get into neurosurgery? And he gave me the funniest look, like, you know, you're in, dude. I mean, it was like, you know, we're, we're, you're, you're there. And, um, and, you know, he made phone calls for me. And, and, you know, I remember that very succinctly. I mean, here is somebody who is, you know, at the top of their field and, and so well respected across uh, pediatric neurosurgery, neurosurgery, medicine. I mean, I mean, Peter Carmel, you know, in and of it himself, you know, was just such a major influence. And, you know, um, it's really because of that, that I, you know, I do very similar. I make phone calls for students and, and try to take them under my wing and, and um, try to promote their careers because that was done for me. And so I really, uh, as part of his legacy, pay that forward very, um, very importantly. Um, you know, I also was very fortunate in in going to a residency, you know, at UCLA and Ward Peacock was there. And I talk about a trailblazer, you know, in the area. And, um, you know, he had just come over to the U.S. and just introduced selective dorsal rhizotomies, you know, from South Africa here in the U.S. and, you know, was growing that uh, technique and in that approach, and you know, again, very dependent on a you know a great team of of therapists and neurophysiology and to make decisions and um, um, really just a unique individual and um, uh, really another huge influence, uh, kind of on my decision to go into pediatric neurosurgery and, and continue in that area. Because, you know, you go to residency and you say, oh, wow, this is cool. You know, I just did this great spine case. And, oh, I just did this great tumor case. And, oh, wow, I just did this AVM. And, you know, next thing you know, you're, you're everything from a spine surgeon to a tumor surgeon to a vascular surgeon. <laughs> but um, um, I ended up circling back to pediatric toward the end of my residency because of Warwick and and uh, Rick Batsdorf, who um, I just enjoyed operating with, and true gentlemen. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate at, um, you know, at the most recent AANS meeting to, to get a chance to see both of them and, and see how vibrant and alive they still are. And, and uh, you know, it, it was great. And then, you know, the other huge influence on me um, that, um, and, and a lot of what I do in the operating room is uh, because of Mike Scott, um, who is at Boston Children's. And um, he was such a gentleman. And uh, we all remember kind of the days of the Giants who also threw things in the OR and screamed at you and everything like that. And um, Mike Scott was just the penultimate gentlemen when things were good or when things were bad he just didn't change and he was just absolutely fantastic and so appreciative and um of everybody and um you know to this day uh i watched him go around at the end of every case and thank everybody in the room for helping and being a part of his that surgery and I follow that to this day, and that's because of him. So he 
truly uh, embodied that concept of this calm, and I'm not always calm, so I have a lot to learn, but that, just that calm and a person who just the meticulousness in every detail, and every detail in the surgery, every detail in his interaction um, with people and with patients, their families, um, with students. Uh, I mean, just, I mean, you you felt like you were the center of attention, you know, whenever you came in. And, and, and so, you know, he was, he was absolutely, and is a, a, just a wonderful individual that I have a huge amount of respect for. Um, you know, and then, you know, really, again, you know, you come out of your training and you're this newly minted, quote unquote, neurosurgeon, you know, and, you know, but I, I really made a conscious effort to um, not want to be a pediatric neurosurgeon on my own in a practice. Um, I, I had those opportunities that, you know, at the time that I was coming out, um, you know, there were a lot of programs looking for, you know, single pediatric neurosurgeons, you know, most of the other people were doing, um, uh, you know, general neurosurgery meant they did pediatric also. And um, it's actually, it'll be 30 years ago next month that I finished, um, or yeah, next month that I finished my residency. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, I, I looked, was looking for a program that had at least one or two other neurosurgeons that I could have as backup and 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 could mentor me and and things like that and you know uh, I just had this amazing opportunity to join you know Leland Albright and and Ian Pollock who you know are are legends in their own right and um, I just I learned so much from both of them. And it was just unbelievable to be partners with them and grow our program and pediatric neurosurgery. I mean, it was, uh, Leland was a, is an amazing leader in that he really saw each of us taking on a subspecialization. There wasn't such thing as subspecialization at that time. You, pediatric neurosurgery was a subspecialization. And so, you know, I, he, we focused on our own areas and we supported each other in, in our own areas. And, um, you know, I, I was taking, I wanted to develop a neurocritical care service. And, and so, but I, uh, it was a little tough trying to take 24, seven, 365. Um, so, but I developed the protocols and Leland and Ian just, they bought into it and they said, whatever you decide, we're going to follow. And, and they did. I mean, it, and it it was a, a lot of learning that here, this guy who's 15, 20 years, my senior is telling me to make the decisions and they're going to follow what I do. I, I just, that that's amazing leadership and another huge role model in that. And, you know, Ian is, uh, I mean, he and I are contemporaries, uh, but he, uh, he was uh, two years ahead of me. And but you know, building and has built an amazing you know brain tumor program and pediatric neurosurgery service and you know I mean again you know his is being a role model you know by you know walking the walk and and talking the talk I mean I think he you know he really embodies that concept of hard work um, you know single-minded purpose and and excellence and and so you know i they were great examples and and it really those those are the individuals through my career and i always i could go on and on i mean there's so many different role models that i've had and you know you take these little pieces from each of them and hopefully they shape you know what becomes you know your reputation or legacy or you know why people want to work with you and you know build with you and and uh, grow with you i i think it highlights it really does take a village 
to have this this fantastic career and all of these influences, I can still point to to what I learned from you and, and all of my other mentors. Um, but it's it's really it's wonderful to see that some of the same people that have shaped you have taken such a strong role in shaping so many other pediatric neurosurgeons across the board. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, it's it's neurosurgery is a small field. I mean, even though it's markedly bigger than when I started it, it, you know, it's, there are so many positive potential mentors and teachers and, and things like that. And, you know, I see people younger than me. I, I hopefully am an old dog still can learn new tricks. So we, we've talked a lot about neurosurgery. Um, but obviously there are, there are two sides of the coin. So how do you, how have you managed to keep your balance between all of your accomplishments in your career and work and, and keeping that personal life that keeps us all human and maintains kind of our, our excitement about everything? Yeah, I I know it's a a real concept today about work-life balance and, um, and I'm, you know, in self-reflection and in, in all honesty, I'm not sure that I'm the best example. Um, you know, I when I was growing up, and I'm a you know a boomer. Um, you know, my my family, you know, grandparents and and um, uh, to some extent, you know, my parents were legacies of the Depression and and the World War II, and and um, you know, their concept of you know, hard work and, and everything was their life. And, you know, I mean, you know, my grandparents, you know, they had, um, you know, their own stores and they, they worked, you know, six days a week and 12, 14 hour days. And so I, I remember, um, um, I was actually meeting with Peter Carmel and was going to do a fourth year rotation with him. And, and, um, uh, you know, I said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in doing the sub I, you know, sub internship with, with you. And he says, well, I, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm really going to, you know, kick your butt, you know, during the rotation. And I shrugged and I said, well, as my grandmother said, a little hard work never hurt anybody. And he, he took a double take and, and smiled and and that's really where we got along from the beginning. So I mean I I really had great role models in my family and and in the people around me and um I I never really saw work as a job. I mean I just love neurosurgery and I love neuroscience and uh, you know, it, it's, I, I haven't really felt, you know, in a real sense of burnout. I wouldn't say that it doesn't happen. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, that would be ludicrous, you know, where you just feel tired out and mentally toast and everything else. Um, maybe a little bit more so, uh, it's a little bit easier to feel toasty around the edges now uh, as you get older. Uh, maybe I don't have as much energy, but um, where I, I really felt that I so enjoyed the process of what we do. Um, and I see life as a living life as a purpose. And I, you know, making a difference and helping others. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I mean, we talk about a, you know, I have a, I work in neurosurgery, but I have a, hobby in neuroscience and I like to build things and I like to make a difference for people, help people. And, you know, I'm very grateful for the privilege to do what I do. And I'm, every day I wake up and I'm just amazed, you know, at some of the things that we do. And, you know, I think it defines why I can get up every morning. you know, who am I going to help today? And who am I going to make a difference in their life or their family's life? Or, and that may be a patient or that could be a student. I mean, you know, helping a student get into medical school or helping 
you know, somebody and, you know, decide on, you know, which job they want to take after their training. Um, I think, you know, those are really what make life worth living. And I think what's really neat about um, academic neurosurgery for me um, is that I, I get to do so many different things. Yes, I get to do clinical, I get to do surgery, um, but I also get to do research and science and quality and education and education, you know, domestically around the world. I get, you know, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I get invited to, I, to such amazing places to speak and to, to learn. And, um, you know, to me, I mean, it's like, you know, what do I have this next week? You know? And I mean, I think, I think that's really what is, um, what's kept me balanced. Now, I, I would say that, um, and I, I know that I'm, I'm saying this somewhat tongue in cheek, but uh, COVID was actually very, very good for me. Um, number one, it stopped me from traveling so much, um, which was which was good. Um, unfortunately, I was also in the demographic of people who were dying. So, I mean, it, it kind of throws a little bit of a scare into you. And so, um, you know, I, I changed my eating and my health approach. And, um, you know, I really, uh, I, I lost a lot of weight and and sort of think healthfully now, hopefully, um, more so. Do more getting out into nature and to doing what I can do at, at least at this point, hiking and camping and um, getting outdoors because I I truly enjoy the outdoors and I think you do need to find that balance. Uh, another mentor of mine is is uh, Joe Maroon, um, who. Uh, I just find amazing and that he is work toward, uh, you know, uh, life as a square and, and balancing all the different uh, legs of the square. Um, I'm far from it. And, uh, but I think, you know, that's what life is. It's, it's continuous improvement and, um, improving yourself. And uh, as I said, I'm maybe not the ex best example of work-life balance, but, uh, but I'm, I'd like to think, you know, and as part of my being a role model or mentor is, is at least continually learning new things and trying to be better. Um, you know, I think that there's, a, there's a, you know, a book out now, you know, about sort of atomic habits and, you know, and, and others where, you know, joy of compounding. And if we really improve ourselves, you know, even you know, minuscule every day, you know, if just that 1% a day, and it, it really builds up into, you know, big changes or big differences down the road. And that's kind of the way I looked at my, hopefully my health and my career and, and, you know, what can I do to be better today, you know, personally or professionally or, or spiritually or, or, or whatever that may be. So as, as we kind of wrap this up, I think one of the things you mentioned, you're at an academic center and education and mentoring students and residents and, and young faculty is such a, a part of your mission in your career. So as, as we think about kind of reflecting back, what advice would you give to either students or residents or young faculty early in their career to really achieve the most uh, for them? personally, professionally, how would you, how would you frame that? Great question. And, and one that I, I, you know, it's really quite funny. I, I speak to a lot of students and residents, fellows, young faculty and, and the like, you know, I, I really, I battled with this over the years, you know, what is, what is really the best approach and, you know, single-mindedness or whatever. And in fact, you know, even I, I really studied this a lot when I was, you know, I, I was um, the CNS president, you know, sort of 2008, 09. And, and, you know, the first things they ask you are, you know, like, what's your theme going to be and things like that. It came up at this meeting too. Um, but, 
you know, it was for me was looking at neurosurgery and neuroscience as a culture of excellence. And so I, you know, I, I used to say to my kids and I don't anymore because it didn't go over well, but uh, perfection is the goal. Excellence will be tolerated. I actually have backtracked on that because it didn't actually work well with my family. Um, I, I like the Lombardi quote more, which is um, perfection is not attainable. Um, but if we chase perfection, we will achieve excellence. And that's kind of the way that I, I think that when I talk to students and, um, and to, to that whole group of people, students, faculty, fellows, residents, whatever, um, you really, in order to chase excellence, what you're always looking to do is to continually improve. And um, I think it's it's about continuous learning. It's about continuous, continuous improvement. You know, as I mentioned just earlier, which, you know, if, if I can just be a little bit better each day, that that will, you know, get me to an, my next goal or my next achievement or whatever that may be in it whether it's to become a neurosurgeon or to um, you know, be the best father or uh, to be the best colleague or, or whatever it may be. I think that we should never stop learning. One of the things that really, really grates at me is when I hear somebody say, oh, well, I've been doing it you know, this way for 30 years and I don't see a reason to change. That, I, that to me is, I mean, in, a, in a, a field like neurosurgery and neuroscience where things are changing at, you know, lightning speed, I, I think it's just so short-sighted if you're not thinking, how do I improve? How do I change? How do I, I learn? I mean, uh, one of my slides in my, one of my epilepsy talks is talking about what I did when I finished training during, you know, what I did during my residency and when I just finished training in epilepsy surgery, and now what I do 30 years later. And it's tripled the amount of procedures and approaches just in epilepsy surgery. So not, I didn't even look at medications or therapies or treatments or any of those things. Well, in order to do those, you need to continually retrain. And so, you know, it's been over the last, five to 10 years that about every year or two, I go and try to learn a new technology or a new technique. Um, sometimes that's not local. Sometimes that requires traveling somewhere and spending a few days or a few weeks or practicing in a lab or, you know, reaching out to colleagues around the country. Um, you know, most recently, you know, I've I didn't do a lot of deep brain stimulation, but now I do a significant amount. But to get to that point, it's there's a lot of different technologies and what are the targeting points and how do you get to those targets and what do you do to do that? And um, those, those could be people within the field. It could be people outside of the field. I mean, and so what I would say would be, don't be afraid to try new things. Uh, it can be very uncomfortable, but, um, and the comfort zone is not there right away, uh, but not being in that comfort zone all the time is a way to push yourself to be better. And um, I think as I've gotten older, um, you become less and less tolerant of, or able to deal with um, bad outcomes. Uh, and I think that you really have to feel that I did absolutely everything that I could, you know, for that patient or that person or that family. And um, I think that's life and that's how you keep on living is, is continually learning new things and push yourself to um, find individuals within or without your field who, um, you know, really can help guide you in, in, you know, new ways and teach you new things and new approaches. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing now. And, and I think that 
the fields of neuroscience and medicine in a lot of ways, there's so much now overlap and so many opportunities for us to um, bring new things. And I think, you know, to be a, a student or fellow or young faculty at this time is such a great era because I do think there's so much more that we can do. Well, that is some definitely some great advice. And I think that that idea of continuous improvement really resonates, especially in our field, which is just advancing day by day. So Dr. Allison, I want to thank you so much for allowing us to have this interview, giving us a little more glimpse into kind of your history and your legacy. Uh, I hope all of you enjoyed this next uh, podcast in the AANS Leaders in Neurosurgery. Uh, and thanks again, Dr. Adelson, for your time. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you to the AANS for including me in this, in this series. Uh, I'm truly, truly honored. And it's such an honor to be interviewed by you, Crystal, um, as, as one of my legacies in, in neurosurgery and pediatric neurosurgery. I'm so proud of you and, and what you're doing. And um, it pleases me so much. Thank you. Thank you.